Hello, my name is Dan Steen, and this presentation is about the project titled Miscibility Gap Alloy Solar Thermal Receiver Design and Testing. I'll begin with a brief summary of the project. This project describes the designing, building, and testing of a new solar thermal MGA receiver. It was built as a replacement for the old receiver and decreased the energy loss to ambient air by firstly installing an insulated flap over the front window and increased insulation thickness around the whole side of the block was also used within the receiver. On top of this, a larger window was used to capture more of the concentrated image of the sun and the storage volume was increased by 100% over the previous receiver to demonstrate the scaling up of the technology. The old receiver can be seen in the picture here up on the dish, which is situated at CSIRO in Mayfield. And this dish has three of its five pedals currently installed. And this gives a heat flux onto the MGA block of about 105 watts per square meter. Before this presentation can go any further, a brief introduction to how miscibility gap alloys, alloys work is required. Miscibility gap alloys are a type of thermal energy storage material used for storing thermal energy in a concentrated solar power plant. The way a typical CSP plant works is the sun's irradiation is directed up onto a tower where it heats up a heat transfer fluid. This heat transfer fluid then passes through a series of heat exchangers where it heats up a power fluid, typically water, and this water upon heating is turned into steam to run a steam turbine. The heat transfer fluid then flows back to the receiver and is heated up again to continue the cycle. Before the heat transfer fluid enters this heat exchanger, it enters what's called a hot tank, which is where it's stored for times of intermittency when there's no sunlight so that the hot heat transfer fluid can be used during the night time to continue to heat up the power fluid and run the cycle at times when there's no sunlight. One of the purposes of MGA is to move this storage volume up into the receiver itself. The way this receiver located uh, storage works is the storage material is located in the receiver and is directly heated by the sun and the power fluid flows through a series of pipes inside this block and that, that's how it's heated by the sun and then the rest of the system just works as normal and the power fluid is heated up to create steam. Now the way that a miscibility gap alloy works is it is a large matrix of graphite which is a very very good thermal energy conductor and inside the matrix embedded in thousands of pockets is a phase change material and the phase change material used in this case is zinc. Now the way a phase change material works is when you heat it up as a solid it um, increases its energy content in a linear fashion and then when it changes phase it increases its energy content without the temperature increasing and this is called its latent phase. And then once it enters back into a fully liquid state, it goes back into a sensible phase and increases temperature and heat content in a linear fashion. The graph here illustrates how this concept works. The reason using a phase change material is so important is that the temperature required to get to a certain heat content is less than if you were just using a purely sensible thermal energy storage material because you get that heat content increase without a temperature increase during that latent phase. This is The reason this is so important is that as you get to really high temperatures of a power fluid or a heat transfer fluid, the efficiency of the whole CSP system begins to decrease and so it's important to not have to have to reach those high temperatures and also producing those high temperatures becomes harder as the temperature increases. Now the way this project unfolded is a model of the previous receiver was developed using ANSYS Mechanical and 
um, number of simulations were performed on this model to validate it against the experimental data which had been performed on the previous receiver late last year. And once the two data sets matched up, this indicated that the model was validated and could be used to design a new receiver. There isn't enough time to talk about how the model was developed, so I'll just go straight into the results of the model. As mentioned previously, one of the improvements made to the new receiver was to have an insulated front window during times when the sun isn't directed at the MGA block. The idea of this was to capture all of the radiation which would other otherwise be lost, and this turned out to be quite a big improvement as you can see in this graph here. This shows the two simulations of the insulated front window and the non-insulated front window. You can see that after four hours, the block with a non-insulated front window cools to about 130 or 120 degrees, and the block with an insulated front window cools to 180. This, these two simulations were with no load applied, so there was no water flowing through the block during cooling. It was just cooling to ambient air. As also mentioned previously, the insulation thickness was increased for this new receiver. This was done by investigating what was called the limiting insulation thickness. This is the point at which any increase in thickness sees no improvement in heat loss for the limiting thickness. This was investigated by increasing the thickness in simulations and looking at how the temperature after six hours changed. As you can see, it begins to plateau at about 70 or 75 millimetres, but it doesn't quite plateau. And so for this interval of thicknesses investigated, it was decided that there was inconclusive evidence to show that there was limiting thickness within this range because it did not plateau properly. Since there wasn't enough evidence to show that there was a limiting thickness, a thickness of 80 millimetres was chosen because this was the maximum thickness that could be used in the receiver that had been designed. Several other improvements were also made to this new receiver. One of them was increasing the window size to capture more of the sun's concentrated image, which would otherwise be reflected if the window were too small. There were also some mechanical improvements in, made. Uh, one of them can be seen in this picture here. In the previous receiver, these pipes came through the bracket that you can see in black there and it made it very hard to assemble and disassemble and also install the receiver. The, this was taken into account in the design of this receiver to make sure that the pipes did not interfere with the bracket. There were a couple of consequences of the virus. One of these was that the experiments could not take place at CSIRO and so to fix this problem a 2 kilowatt lamp from uni was used at home and this was used to simulate the concentrated sunlight. Obviously it was nowhere near as powerful as the concentrated sunlight and so the block could not be heated quite as much but it could still be used to validate the model and perform experiments. Another problem that occurred is that because of the depopulation of campus the MGA block could not be manufactured in time. To overcome this a graphite block was used in its place However, this meant that the latent heat phase could not be investigated experimentally, but this wasn't a huge problem. Um, and also the graphite has similar thermal properties to the MGA, so this was ideal. Most of the experiments involved heating the block up using a lamp to about 320 degrees Celsius, and then turning the tap on and running water through the block and letting it cool without the lamp on and it cooled for about an hour for each experiment. These experiments were done roughly under three different flow rates of 0 0.063, 0 0.0903 and 0 0.1329 kilograms per second and they were done for both the insulated and the non-insulated front window of the receiver. One interesting thing that you can see in this graph here is that even with the three different flow rates, the blocks cooled at the exact same rate 
for both the insulated and the non-insulated window. What this tells us is that the heat flow is independent of the flow rate of the water. This is important because it means that the heat flux of thermal energy from the block to the water is not dependent on the mass flow rate of water, but it's only dependent on the block temperature itself. As you can see, this line here is not straight. It, uh, the thermal energy flow decreases with the block temperature, which makes sense because the temperature differential between the water and the block decreases. This allowed me to create a lookup table using experimental data, and this gave the heat flow and the heat flux that could be expected for a given pipe area and a given block temperature. Using this data, I could then go on to model the same receiver, but with more than one pass of water going through the receiver. Um, and I did this from zero passes up to 15. This could not be verified experimentally because it was far too difficult to put that number of passes through the receiver. But because of this fact of the constant heat, I was still able to model these multiple passes quite accurately to get the expected results. Before these simulations were performed for a great number of passes, I modified the receiver at home to perform experiments with three passes instead of a single pass. And this is the data that I got from that, including the simulated data for three passes. Uh, you can see that they all match up very closely, including the three pass experimental data for three different flow rates. And this just verifies the fact made in the single pass data that the heat flow from the block to the water is independent of the mass flow rate of water. Because you can see these three lines for different mass flow rates match up quite well. The problem with this is that you don't have very much control over the heat flow of energy from the block to the water. So you don't have very much control over the power output of the whole system. This is an issue because during times of high power demand, for instance, you might require a high power output of the system, but you can't generate that and you can't control that with a single pipe. This is why having multiple pipes through the MGA block is really important. This graph here shows a simulation for 1, 3, 5, 9 and 15 passes and the cooling rates to expect for a, a given mass flow rate of water for these numbers of passes. Up to this point, all the experiments and simulations shown have been for a graphite block and this was due to the restrictions because I, I could only use a graphite block experimentally. However, because the model has been validated with the graphite block as shown, and it's also been validated for the MGA model, as was done with the experimental data from the previous receiver, this meant that I could take the thermal properties for MGA and put them into this new model and simulate what an MGA behavior might look like for these multiple passes. As you can see here, you can see the latent phase quite clearly during the charging phase and also during the cooling phase. And this occurs at about 420 degrees because that's the melting point of the zinc. This graph also tells us similar information to the previous graph that you gain a lot more control by having a higher number of passes going through the block. And so for future designs of MGA receivers, it's very important that there are multiple passes going through the block and not a single pass because this increases control. This project had a number of other conclusions and results which I don't have time to go through, but I'll just leave you with this picture here which shows the new receiver on the right and the front window of the previous receiver just for a bit of a size comparison of the two. Thank you for listening to my presentation.